Smoky Mountain since first I was my mother's daughter. And you can't just take my dreams away. And not with me watching, you may drive a big machine. But I was born a great big woman. And you can't just take my dreams away without me fighting. because I'd started working as early as I did, at 10, and had never had a vacation in my life. Who the hell in my predicament would think of taking a vacation? We just didn't. In those days, we didn't have 10 packs. The men would say, look, those girls, they're sweating blood. We literally didn't have any time to go change. Where I worked in the silk mill, they bring out these big trays of uh, viscose, and they were wringing wet, and they smelled terrible, just like acid. It gets in your hair, and you smell like a wet dog. <laughs> it gets in your hands, your skin. You have a date. You have to wash and wash and wash. And you still smell like a silk mill girl. And I had worked there for 13 years. They bring my summer school for working women. But I just assumed that my father would not let me go because the four dollars that I earned a week would be lost. So I never even told him. And the whole year I had the blues. Finally, I told him, I have a chance to go to summer school. We were sitting at the table. He got up. He started to walk. Finally, he stood. To think that a child of mine, whom I was not able to give the education that she deserved, so that last had a chance, and he almost cried. He was so happy. This was my rebellion to come here and quit that job. You worked, you knew to work, and that's it. When you come here and you see this, what can you say? My attitude was, I can't get to like this too much. So I picked out my picture of when I graduated from Bryn Mawr. And the teacher said, well, she has her nerve. How could she go to Bryn Mawr and work in a factory? And I said, yes, that was the summer school that I went to. The school was the brainchild of M. Carey Thomas, president of Bryn Mawr, one of the seven sisters' colleges of the Northeast. She was at the end of a career as a brilliant educator and feminist. I saw as part of my vision that the coming of equal opportunity for the manual workers of the world might be hastened by utilizing the deep sympathy that women now feel for one another. The first steps might well be taken by college women who themselves, just emerging from the wilderness, know what it means to be denied access to things of the intellect and spirit. Thomas was used to getting her way and swiftly pushed the idea for the summer school through the Board of Trustees. Working women in a privileged environment, no one had any idea where it would lead. Her smartest move was naming Hilda Worthington Smith the director. Jane, as we called her, once said that the students made her ashamed of her indifference and boredom, that this challenge had given her life meaning once again. Very often they were pretty discouraged at first. I remember once an Italian girl came to me and she said, well, my neighbor is crying. I went up to see her and she said, I don't think I can stay here. It's much too beautiful. I can't be here while my sisters and my, my friends are in these bad conditions in the factories. Well, I asked her if she'd stay a week and try it out. And at the end of the week, she said, I think I see a little gleam of hope. Hilda Smith, she was like an angel. I mean, disembodied of all 
human needs. Anything that Hilda wanted was something that would help with her obsession, which is to give opportunities to working women to get an education. All of us were apprehensive about the fact that we were coming into school beyond our intelligence, we thought, and we were suspicious of each other, uh, especially because we had a mixture of people who spoke with a draw, somebody with a Brooklynese accent, and uh, some of them couldn't speak English very well. We thought, what in the world kind of place did we come into, you know? And maybe I was a little skeptical, because I had suffered from intolerance, and I thought, well, maybe I can give some of it back. When I came to Bryn Mawr, I had plenty chips on my shoulders. See, my feeling was, I'm streetwise, and I started young on the street. And these people are going to tell me what's what. But come on, you can be streetwise and not know what the hell you're saying. Go free to America. Apply to certain people. That's all it said. And when I was accepted, people said, don't go, don't go. It's the white slave traffic. <laughs> the idea of having a reunion was so exciting. After 50 years, we never thought we'd be together again. How did I get to the summer school? I was teaching gym at the Windsor School for Girls, and uh, Jane had come to speak to the students there at Windsor. I was absolutely captivated. And immediately I said, that's the way I want to be. And the stories that she told of the school and what it meant to these people, I thought, here's a life. And I went up to her afterwards and said, how do you do it? How, did, how could I get into it? And that, I had an interview and she gave me a job as gym teacher. Each year, the students were found and the money raised by committees composed of alumni and friends from all over the country. When the school opened, everybody came in through Rockefeller and the Arch. And they immediately said, well, does Mr. Rockefeller own the school? And then we had labor conferences of labor leaders. And they were very, very cynical. And they told the students not to trust Bryn Mawr College. They said, it's only capitalistic propaganda and just be very suspicious. And they were suspicious for a while. And we had long discussions on tainted money. They decided it was more important where the money went than where it came from, finally. We would go out to the Bryn Mawr alumni. They would have teas in the various communities to help raise scholarships so that the girls could come. And I remember feeling quite self-conscious there. I even had my first manicure, I remember, so that I would be sure that I would handle the teacup properly. And Mrs. Stokes here was responsible for this Philadelphia area. And I'd like her to add a few comments on this money business. I don't know. I, I, I simply picked out my victims. Yes. <laughs> That's a good term. Almost the first day the students arrived on the campus, <laughs> they ganged up on Hilda Smith and said, we got a complaint. You have put the maids in the attic in the hottest rooms in the dormitories. We would like to see them given better quarters. The summer school was so different from the winter school. The students made their own beds. We didn't have to serve them in the dining room. It was a cafeteria style. And I never lived so nice. I had a, a room. Uh, we had a sitting room and a bedroom on each side. Down the hall, we could make coffee. We had a lot of coffee clutches in the middle of the night. Think we can find the old room? When I went to Bryn Mawr, I hadn't been any higher than the eighth grade in school. So all this was like almost a college degree to me, so I had to step up to what they were trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. And let's take a peek in here, see if it looks let's the same. There it is. You remember it was my first experience to have a room to myself. 
immigrants, you know, they uh, could not afford to have separate rooms for different members of the family. Look at the bay window. You remember when we looked over and saw the lawn, how beautiful it was? Every tree had a, something going on uh, under that tree. There was a group discussing economics and so on. And the courses were, in fact, very well balanced. The hundred or so students were divided into groups of 20, called units. They took two basic courses together from an economist and an English teacher. Jane always said that we had to have in each unit a little world, geographically and racially, and we had to have the basic industries there. She insisted that they be little worlds. And they took people who were not bound by lines of different disciplines. Economics, history, sociology, law, politics. One affects the other so intimately that it's presumptuous to think of yourself as belonging to one field. It was an education to be here, really. We had the kind of education that is really not given to the people in a regular high school because it wasn't routinized and it wasn't uh, just fed to us. There was so much uh, discussion back and forth between teachers and students, which made it a different experience. Because here it was there, it was real, they wanted to learn. And it wasn't a matter of how do you prepare to get people to want it, it was get them enough stuff and get the material. It was a complete reversal of what I had been led to believe that teaching was. We had famous speakers almost every week. People came like the British economist Harold Lasky, Margaret Sanger, W.E.B. Du Bois, Norman Thomas, Francis Perkins, Walter Ruther, and Jane's good friend, Eleanor Roosevelt. For the life of me, I can't remember if somebody came from the Republicans. But I know they were all invited. That was very definite part of it. We had to give everybody an opportunity to be heard. And we used to have meetings after, after dinner of the faculty. Endless meetings discussing how. How you teach workers. It was all foolish. There's nothing in it except association of a teacher with the individual student. Jane had established that the very best people in economics, in English, and uh, so on, would be recruited here as faculty. Well, I think they were all people of some originality, and this was a challenge because there was prejudice against workers' education at that time. We were too radical and dangerous, insidious, and so on. Did you ever have Amy Hughes in the classroom? Oh, yes. <laughs> Do you remember the morning she said, how many of you think that the uh, laundry is a factory? We all were stunned. Yes. Why, the laundry is no factory. They all were. they do is wash clothes. Now, you remember that? Do you they remember weren't that? making anything. They were <coughs> just doing something. But she insisted. Now, I want an, an answer from you. You're evading the question. It finally turned out, sure, I'm selling my labor. Oh, she said, you mean you, you're a commodity? And we got the first inkling of what economy and what social problems means when you sell your labor. That's when the question of union came in. There were predominantly, of course, women here as faculty members, and that was so unusual for the time. Gladys Palmer was here from the University of Pennsylvania as an economist. Helen Lockwood came from Vassar as an English teacher. Women were drawn to labor economics at that time and were, were really prominent in the whole field then, and we had them here. Another was Louise Brown, who was a naturalist. Some of the memorable occasions with her were not in a classroom at all. As it got dark, she gave us uh, informal lectures in astronomy. Uh, and it, that, that seemed a very far out uh, thing to be part of the program, but it was absolutely within the concept 
that the stars were everybody's stars, if you could see them, and those that had been brought up in the city, under the bright lights of the city, had literally never even seen the stars. And we'd go each night and watch the moon through the telescope. And all through the years, I've been able to see the beauty of the moon, the craters on the moon and whatnot. So that particular night, I became a student at Bryn Mawr Summer School. I had really seen something that would last me the rest of my life. So all we'd have to do is look at the stars at night, and we'd forget the meanness of mankind. There was an innocence and directness about Hilda Smith, which made her oblivious to ordinary barriers. In 1926, she invited five black women, the first ever at Bryn Mawr College, to enroll in the summer school. Her plan provoked a sharp response from M. Carey Thomas. Dear Hilda, I am happy to hear that the summer school is so satisfactory this year. Personally, I hope that you will not complicate its full success by asking the girls to live, sleep, and eat with even a very few Negro girls. Susan B. Anthony always used to say, do not mix reforms, but drive straight to your goal, looking neither to the right nor to the left. Here we are, girls. This is the class of 1926. Oh, I should see it. When we were young and ambitious, you know this one? Yeah. And little old me here. Is this you? Yeah. Oh, my that gracious. <laughs> and this was the first year that they accepted the black women. And as you notice, there are... What year was that? 26. 26. It was a smooth, integrating thing. I mean, it wasn't any, any fanfare or anything that was uh, unpleasant about it. It just seemed as a thing that was going to happen or did happen. And I don't think anybody, any of us realized that there had been any discussion about it at all. I was the second black person from the South. There were five black people here that summer. You, you, you didn't feel any difference. They felt that you could achieve and they drew you in. I, uh, they even thought that I could write some poetry and I worked on a magazine here. The school's openness and flexibility were primarily from Jane. She made us feel we had a job to do. She didn't compel us, but showed us how, sometimes through her poetry. I heard the message, heard it plain. I came north on the freedom train. Jobs up north just got word. Best good news I ever heard. Got to the north, thought I'd like to shout. Bosses wouldn't hire me. The unions kept me out. Tried to get some supper and a glass of beer. Waiter turned me out of doors, said, no niggers here. Some people didn't care to do anything about poetry. They wanted something more serious, they said. A lot of people don't believe it made any sense to teach factory women poetry. What did you say to them? I say there's nothing to say. <laughs> I think I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. It's really beautiful. It really brings memories of when we used to come from our rooms and sit on the lawn in the evenings and sing all kinds of songs, beautiful songs. Some of those Irish melodies were gorgeous. And of course the Italians had to a, had a put on a show too, you know. <laughs> They'd start with the sextet from Lucia. And I used to take the role of the Mad Lucia. <laughs> the uh, baseball games that we had, the faculty would dress up in ridiculous attire. Amy Hughes, a little bit of a thing, I adore that woman. She came along at this game with a hammer and sickle, and she's carrying, she's going to be the water boy. When we shouted for water, she'd say, capitalist, capitalist. <laughs> it just, it was a fun thing. It was a time to learn to relax. I know I needed it, and I know damn well some of the others needed it.
and some of our chips began to fell off, you see. I didn't know how to swim, and I learned how to swim in this pool here. And let me tell you, when I celebrated that day, woo, I wanted to have a bottle of champagne. No, a pool of champagne to really celebrate. I think of Esther Peterson, who's standing around there grinning at us and saying, if you want to do it, let's see how you can do it. She hasn't lost that lovely grin. She still does the same thing. But now, we really have stories. Come on, Ronnie. Come on, Holly. They have been with us from the very beginning. <laughs> point where the students asked to be part of the governance of the school. M. Kerry Thomas's first reaction was, what? We're the educators, they're the students. Nonsense. And Jane had the wit and wisdom to bring some of the students to a luncheon that Thomas was having and gave her a chance to hear from them. Miss Thomas, who was always very dramatic, got up in her light and said, well, I've changed my mind. And I understand that what the workers want is real education. They don't want propaganda. And I'm willing to have them come on the board in equal numbers with the college people. History didn't just happen to you. It was up to you to change it. That's what we were starting to believe. The first event that attracted the active involvement of the students at the summer school was the Sacco and Vanzetti case, the arrest and trial of two immigrant workers for murder it provoked a worldwide controversy in the 20s. The judge was so prejudiced that he, every time he'd strike the gavel, he'd almost sound as though, you're guilty, you're guilty. That's the way it sounded to us when we'd hear about it. And we heard there was going to be a rally in, in, uh, in Philadelphia. And those of us in the class, in Bryn Mawr class, were very anxious to attend. We had our own committee. And we took that up. And then we took it up with the rest of the personnel. And they said that if we wanted to go, we should do so. So we went. And before we know it, there was some rumpus on the, on the line. And Mark Starr, a professor in Bryn Mawr, he was arrested. And much to the anger of the board of directors of Bryn Mawr, that a great big strip on the Philadelphia paper appeared of Bryn Mawr, a bit, hotbed of radicalism. Was the print was about this big, right across the way. Who will remember Judge Webster there? One hand on the gavel, the other resting on his chair. Who will remember the hateful words he said? Speaking to the living in the language of the dead. And all who know these two good arms know I never had to run. In spite of all the protests all over the world, they went ahead. And on the night they were to be electrocuted, my brother and I went to a rally and prayed that it wouldn't happen. Who will remember the one who pulled the switch that took the lives of two good men in the service of the rich? And then, lo and behold, word came into the auditorium where thousands of people were gathered. The men are dead. I just couldn't believe it had happened in the United States of America. And we went out, my brother and I, and we sat on the curb of the street, and we both cried. He held me in his arms, and I held him in mine. And I said, they're gone. Our friends are gone. And all who knew these two I'm sorry if I cried, but 
two human beings were accused only because they were foreigners. To rob or kill. Each had lived by his own two hands and lived well. And all their lives they had struggled to rid the earth of all such crimes. And all our lives we must struggle to rid the earth of all such crimes. Jane taught me that we were to draw out the experience of these women as the basis of our teaching. We made a great point of getting life stories, what we would now call mm -hmm. depth mm -hmm. interviews, mm -hmm. sometimes for hours on end and for several days. This became one of the publications of the school, mm -hmm. the lives of these, uh, of these working women. The women said, you don't really want these little things, and mm -hmm. I really wanted them, and it came pouring out. At first I lost my job, but that wasn't the final blow. Dad was laid off too. We were ever conscious of the piling up of bills, bills, and more bills, and every one of us were on the rocks. No money, no credit, no guts. That was us. One person breaks down quicker than others. My husband lost his regular job three years ago. He is an ever-smiling, high-spirited young man. But since a year, his contented, almost childish smile slowly dies away. His laughing eyes look sadly about. He feels unnecessary and thinks he is just a burden. These are terrible thoughts which poison a man's life. During the Depression, we had a very difficult time here because men from the bread lines, unemployed men, who were relatives of the students here, uh, a lot of them are sleeping on the, on the floor of the uh, Bryn Mawr station, I remember. And the students were sort of bootlegging food from the, from the table to, to feed them. And one or two students were keeping little sisters in their room. And our budget began to go up. And it was pretty difficult. So we called a, a meeting of the whole school. And they decided that, we would, that they, we would furnish food for the nearer relatives of those students. The Depression hit rock bottom in 1932 as Professor Colson Warren organized a trip to Washington. When thousands of World War I vets encamped in Washington in 1932, demanding early payment of their bonuses, they called it the Bonus Army. This was history in the making, and I had to see it. So off I went. President Hoover called in the Army under Douglas MacArthur to rout the men and their families. I watched the burning of squatters' houses by the army. Everyone at the school was very much interested. In the evenings when classes were over, we would sit on the lawn in front of the library, and I would tell the others what I had seen. The election of Roosevelt changed the course of the summer.